We interrupt this program for a special bulletin. Here now is Sandy Hill. Seismologists at Caltech now report at least three separate seismic events tonight, each in the northern hemisphere with earth tremors of magnitude 8.5 and above. Now, the first location is believed to be in the Thunder Basin area of Wyoming. That's about 200 miles east of Casper. So far, we have no reports of casualties. The other two sites in Europe and Asia have not been identified. But stay tuned to 11 o'clock news for further details. We now resume our regularly scheduled program. this program for a special report from Evening World News in Washington. Here now is Chief National Affairs Correspondent Sandra Van Oker. Good evening. A meteor shower, which appears at this time every year, erupted into a massive cosmic event tonight as pieces of an enormous asteroid plunged to Earth. Reports are just coming in, but it appears that at 8.24 p.m. Eastern Time, the near-Earth asteroid known as 6645 Venturi hurtled from space and broke apart striking the Earth at three separate points around the globe. After shocks were felt from Kamchatka Island in the Aleutians to Santiago, Chile. In all three cases, the meteorites hit deserted rural areas, leaving wide impact zones. Scientists say if any one of them had struck near an urban center, the results would have been catastrophic. We begin our coverage with correspondent Pamela Barnes outside Mount Palomar Observatory in the mountains east of San Diego. Sandy, as this story first broke, the report suggested that three massive earthquakes struck worldwide. The initial shock waves registered within minutes of each other at Caltech. The best image we have right now is this infrared shot from a KH-11 reconnaissance satellite. The crater is 2.4 kilometers wide, more than a mile and a half across. The red you see around the rim is a section of scorched earth from a wildfire that set the grasslands ablaze at the moment of impact. Correspondent Bree Walker was vacationing in Wyoming when the meteor hit. She came in with the first fire crews, and we go to her above the crater. I'm told we're having trouble with the feed from Wyoming, so we'll bring Bree Walker's report to you as soon as possible. In the meantime, we go to Barry Steinbrenner of affiliate KTML in Casper, Wyoming. With fires from the meteor crater raging out of control, units from the 3rd Air National Guard Wing were quickly called in to extinguish the flames. More than 10,000 people living west of Thunder Basin are being evacuated by National Guardsmen amid fears the fires may spread. And there are numerous reports of power outages both north and east of Cheyenne. This is Barry Steinbrenner, KTML Action News, Casper, Wyoming. I'm told we've now contacted correspondent Bree Walker. She now brings us pictures of what is being called Impact Site Alpha, located 60 miles north of Grover's Mill, Wyoming. Bree, can you hear us? Sandy, as you well know, I've covered my share of disasters. The L.A. riots, Hurricane Andrew, last year's floods in the Mississippi, even Mount St. Helens when she blew. But nothing I've ever encountered could have prepared me for this. Let's give you a look from the chopper's camera mounted below. What you're looking at now is, is the crater itself. A massive inferno is the only way you could describe this. In fact, one of the firefighters I talked to said temperatures were near 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit and above. Any human being within miles of this impact would have been incinerated in seconds. As we came in through the smoke and the haze along the crater's east rim, the scene of devastation below was unbelievable, with dozens of state troopers and National Guardsmen surrounding the impact site. When the asteroid hit, it touched off a massive firestorm that destroyed much of Thunder Basin. We're told that chopper you see down below is flying a team of hazardous material specialists from the Department of Energy. We expect that they'll be checking for a, a radiation or any potentially deadly chemicals that might still be off-gassing from the site. And Sandy? Sandy, we're just getting word that there may have been some survivors along the Thunder Basin National Grasslands. We're going to go over there now for a look. The two other pieces of this gigantic meteorite came down first in the Gobi Desert of China along the southern edge of Mongolia. And minutes later, in a mountainous area of the Pyrenees, about 20 miles south of Lourdes in southern France. Now tentatively known as Impact Site Bravo, Lourdes was the site in 1858 of a fabled visitation by the Virgin Mary. It's been a mecca for religious pilgrims ever since. But tonight, as correspondent Paul Whitaker reports, the mood there is one of fear. The churches are full here tonight. 
with religious pilgrims giving thanks, but not because they came to this holy site, because they're alive. Only hours before the asteroid fell in the mountains to the south, hundreds of people were still on the snow-capped peaks after a long day of recreation and skiing. On était dans le dernier téléphérique de la journée, he was in the last avec tous les cable amis, car off the mountain, et puis coup, tout, tout just as the earth started ça, to shake, et puis, uh, le ciel he and his friends avec looked up to the sky feu, uh, and saw a huge puis, fireball uh, streaking dit, across uh, the sky. This woman, Sylvie Chenard, also survived, but when she got down, she discovered her husband, Jean-Paul, was missing. Il, um, il était le dernier à descendre la pente, il voulait skier encore une fois. Um, I, uh, he, I, I took down the cable car and uh, Jean said he, uh, he wanted to ski down for the last run of the day. And he, he, he didn't come, he didn't come back. Ironically, today was their third anniversary. French rescue teams are combing the mountainside for skier Jean-Paul Chenard. A bitter twist to an already frightening turn of events. The French have an expression, plus a change, plus a la même chose. The more things change, the more they stay the same. But tonight, as the lucky ones celebrate, happy to be alive, one senses these people will never be quite the same again. Paul Whitaker reporting from Lourdes, France. Little is known tonight about the third impact site in China. But as correspondent Denise Wong reports in Beijing, the communist government has put the country on a state of alert. Sandy, it's just after 10.15 in the morning here in Beijing. Sin Xinhua, the Chinese news agency, has reported that the third asteroid hit at 9.29 a.m. Beijing time. It struck at 105 degrees east, 45 degrees north along China's border with Mongolia. While little more has come from the government here, Reuters has just released this aerial photo taken by the French satellite agency SPOT from 12 miles above the Earth. Uh, the crater is almost a mile and a half across. Denise, that's almost identical, I repeat, identical to the Wyoming impact site. What do you know about casualties? Well, Sandy, uh, Tian Song is in a remote area of the Gobi Desert with no rail lines and few highways in or out. As a result, it may be days before the full damage from this third impact site can be assessed. We'll be back to you, Denise, as soon as there's more. I thank you. We switch now to the Johnson Space Center, where Matt Jensen is standing by. Sandy, the NASA scientists who track these enormous asteroids sometimes refer to them as killer rocks. As such, one of the first questions we asked was how. How could an asteroid of this magnitude have come so close to Earth and not be detected till impact? In July, the comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 struck the planet Jupiter in a series of massive impacts equal in force to two million hydrogen bombs. These events were monitored worldwide through the enormous eye of the Hubble Space Telescope orbiting the Earth. Scientists had known for months that these events on Jupiter were about to take place. In fact, they were actually able to predict the precise moments of impact. Dr. Kurt Loudon was one of the NASA scientists tracking Shoemaker-Levy. Well, what about it, Doctor? Why the surprise this time? Well, first off, there are at present some 2,500 near-Earth asteroids, magnitude one mile and above, that could intersect with the Earth. We've only identified about 10% of them, and those have all been on benign trajectories. Until tonight. Yes, well, you see, uh, if an asteroid is coming directly towards the Earth, it's very difficult to see it until it's literally on top of us. Dr. Loudon, this is Senator Van Oak in Washington. Do I understand you to say the Earth is at risk from more of these asteroids? Well, not to sound alarmist, but if one of those rocks came down on a big city, Well, what, Doctor? Let's just say it would make Hiroshima seem like a three-alarm fire. Thank you. That was Dr. Kurt Loudon at the Johnson Space Center. In a moment, we'll be joined by Dr. Carolyn Jaffe, Evening World News Science Editor. But first, some rather startling developments from correspondent Bree Walker. Sandy, we're told now that at least three men perished in the firestorm touched off by the impact from the meteorite believed to be sheep ranchers who were leasing grazing lands from the nearby Thunder Basin National Grasslands. What you are seeing is live and unedited. It's hard to believe, but only a month ago I was camping in these hills. This was lush, green grazing land, leased by the federal government. Now it's all just ash and char. You can see the, the bodies of dead animals scattered everywhere. Bree, you, should know, you should know your signal's breaking up. Kind of Wait a minute, something moved. What? What? Where? Down there to the left. You see that thing by the Let's get a closer look. Go in. Oh, oh, you brought... I see God. It's moving. All I know is the helicopter is over Thunder Basin National Grasslands. You have the picture. Come on, Billy. Let's go down. It's a human being. Let's go get her. Come on, Billy. Okay. I have no idea how anyone could have survived this. 
but that Please. is a human being. It appears to be a child. It's a child. We're moving in. What you're seeing, Ree Walker, her cameraman, Billy Dunn. Now you're not seeing it. I hope you will. They're moving in. There they are. She, that's Bree moving in on what appears to be a survivor. She's moving, moving toward the child. Okay. She's moving toward the child. There she is. It's okay. Cameraman William Dunn behind her. It is definitely a child. It's all right. Okay. It looks like it is a little girl. It is a little girl. I cannot tell you what she is saying. As you can see, she appears badly burned. How she survived, I will never know. Apparently, we've lost our signal. That's just extraordinary to think that anyone could have survived so close to that fire zone. It appears the child was trying to say something, something incomprehensible. She obviously was in shock. We'll try to get back with Correspondent Walker to learn more about that little girl's condition. In the meantime, we'll give our affiliates a chance to break. This is Sandra Van Oker in Washington. Here once again is Senator Van Oker. If you're just tuning in, all of us witnessed a remarkable rescue tonight. After three fragments from a giant asteroid fell to Earth causing untold damage worldwide, an evening world news crew was flying over one of the impact sites when they saw something moving. Correspondent Bree Walker and cameraman William Dunn found a survivor, a little girl. We still don't know who she is or what she was saying. At this moment, our helicopter is flying her to Mercy Medical Center in Casper, Wyoming, and we'll get word to you on her condition just as soon as we have it. Joining me now is our science editor, Dr. Carolyn Jaffe. Sandy, in the grip of a story like this, it's a reporter's job to hold back, remain dispassionate, and yet, when you look in the eyes of that child, you can't help but be moved. I understand you prepared a report on just how powerful these meteors can be. That's right, Sandy. The uh, philosopher George Santayana once said that he who forgets history is destined to repeat it. Well, the three asteroid fragments that rained down on the Earth tonight uh, weren't the first and most likely they won't be the last. The crater at Winslow, Arizona, more than half a mile across, an enormous hole caused by an iron asteroid just 60 meters wide that hit more than 50,000 years ago. In 1908, an object the same size exploded a few miles above the ground near Tunguska River in Siberia. The shockwave, with the force of 15 hydrogen bombs, incinerated millions of acres in an impact area that would have spread from Maine to the Carolinas if it had hit the Northeast. But both of these were just BB shots compared to the big one. Known now as the KT event, scientists now believe an object in the order of 7 to 10 kilometers wide impacted 65 million years ago along the Mexican Yucatan Peninsula. A month after impact, the debris from the giant crater covered the Earth in a dust-like cloud that blocked out virtually all sunlight. Billions of life forms were killed within weeks and ultimately the dinosaurs that had ruled the world for 140 million years perished. And Sandy, if an asteroid even one half that size were to hit the Earth today, the death rate could easily match that of the Black Plague, which wiped out half the population in Europe during the Middle Ages. Well, the question I've got to put to you is how real is the threat to the Earth today? I'm afraid it's quite real. Two years ago, NASA scientists calculated that the odds of a person dying from a near-Earth asteroid were about 1 in 20,000, about the same as being killed in an airline crash. And that's what they assumed? Until tonight. You see, the danger is increasing. Why is that? Astronomers at NASA's JPL say there is a 20% likelihood that because of the meteor shower tonight, we can expect more of these Earth-bound asteroids. Forgive me, I apologize, but they're ready now for that report from NASA, and we go to the Johnson Space Center, where correspondent Matthew Jensen is standing by. Matt? Sandy, the men and women who track these giant near-Earth objects have been working non-stop to analyze the data ever since the first impact at 724 Central Time. We were inside the operations center where we regularly follow the shuttle flights. Then, just moments ago, some data came in from NASA's big radio telescope at Goldstone in the Mojave Desert, and all reporters were asked to move behind this wall of glass. They say a statement is imminent, but right now, we're watching and waiting. 
We'll be back to you, Matt. But first, for an insight on what may be happening, we go to correspondent Warren Olney at Goldstone. Warren? Sandy, this enormous 70-meter steerable antenna is part of NASA's deep space network used to track spacecraft. When a comet or asteroid is identified by wide-field telescopes like the one at Mount Palomar, the data is fed here, and the space debris, as they call these killer rocks, is then tracked with precision. Now, the scientists who work here are normally rather cool, understated people. But about an hour ago, when the data on 6645 Venturi was fully analyzed, this marine helicopter made an unscheduled landing. A pair of MPs raced inside. They emerged minutes later with one of the scientists here, and they rushed him aboard the chopper. No word yet on the scientist's name or his position with NASA. But sources say he was flown to nearby Edwards Air Force Base for a trip by jet to the Space Center in Houston. Warren, what could have been so important that they couldn't have linked up with Houston by phone or a teleconference? Another good question with no answer from here, Sandy. One source says that the scientist's involvement may have something to do with the asteroid's trajectory, both before and after it broke up. Thank you very much. We've just received an update from correspondent Denise Wong in Beijing. There are no known casualties near the third impact site designated Charlie. However, the impact is said to have damaged the Tingshin Hydroelectric Dam, 40 kilometers to the south. Power outages have been reported throughout most of Langshan province, and the Chinese government is requesting emergency generating equipment and Red Cross assistance for the estimated 7.5 million people now without electricity or running water. Doctor, we've just gotten word on the condition of that little girl found wandering near the Wyoming impact site. We go now to evening World News correspondent Bree Walker standing by at Mercy Medical Center in Casper. The little girl we found at the scene was badly burned. She's in intensive care now, being treated for exposure and second-degree burns. Doctors have sedated her, and they say she's resting comfortably. Meanwhile, the Macomb County Sheriff's Department has set up a special hotline to try to find out who the little girl is. If you can help, here's the number, 1-800-555-4818. Bree Walker, Evening World News, Casper, Wyoming. There's more now on the fate of another victim, French skier Jean-Paul Chounard. After combing the area near the second asteroid impact site, French rescue workers came upon Jean-Paul Chounard huddled in a snow cave near the base of Mount Vinmen. We'll have an update soon from correspondent Paul Whitaker in southern France. Sandy, in this era of home video where people seem to shoot everything, I guess this was inevitable. We've just received tape from KWBF, our affiliate in Newcastle, Wyoming, some 80 miles from the impact site. It purports to show asteroid fragment Alpha streaking across the sky as it roars towards Thunder Basin. I'm told it was shot by Chris O'Neill, the father of three from Newcastle. The voice you're hearing is Mr. Okay. O'Neill's. Come on out, I'm freezing. <laughs> oh, Tyler, you look great. Pretty scary. Joshua? Gosh, that's an ugly mask, Actually, buddy. You look great. Come on, doesn't she Come look... Come on, Ashley. Tell Daddy what you're going to say when you go to the front door. Trick or treat. <laughs> oh, that's great. What is that? Get the kids in the house. The tape was analyzed by the FAA, and apparently that was the alpha fragment from 6645 Venturi. We're going to watch it once more as it comes into the camera's lens. Get the kids in the house. Sandy, we're happy to report that no one was hurt, and the children went on to trick-or-treat with one incredible story to tell. Well, thank goodness for that. There's new information on that scientist rushed to Houston to confer with NASA officials. He is Dr. Avram Mandel, an astrophysicist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab. Sandy, sources say Dr. Mandel visits the Space Center here in Houston at least once a month, but this is far from a routine trip. In fact, we've just learned that he's flown here not on a conventional carrier, but in the jump seat of an Air Force F-16. With a maximum airspeed of more than 1,400 miles an hour, the flight time from Edwards to Houston should put Dr. Mandel on the ground some 22 minutes from now. Sandy, correspondent Robert Marino has just flown in from Denver, and he is at the edge of impact site Alpha. Apparently, the police there have just changed the ground rules. Robert? All of the news crews here have been asked to pull back from the immediate edge of the crater. The official reason is safety. State police saying that there have been aftershocks as a result of the impact. But none of the press on the ground here has felt anything. And there's been stepped-up activity at the crater by NASA scientists. We shot this video only moments ago. Sandy, as you can see, dozens of investigators from NASA and the Pentagon have been flown into the site, which is now beginning to resemble a small air base. Uh, you can see a chopper below landing, carrying additional troops armed with assault weapons. Why the government would need firepower like that at the site of a meteor impact is anybody's guess. Uh, we're told among the personnel being moved to the site is a team of map makers from the U.S. Geological Survey. In addition, 
The FAA has now established a no-fly zone immediately over the crater. They've made it quite clear that anyone violating this restriction would be fired upon. So if these are the last pictures you're likely to see for a while. Uh, Sandy, at impact Robert, site... we're going to have to cut away. A statement is imminent from the press room at the Johnson Space Center. We go now to correspondent Matt Jensen. After a virtual blackout since the first impact, Dale Powell, NASA's Director of Community Relations, is about to speak. Mr. Powell, can you I have a, um, I have a short statement. There will be no questions at this time. Let me just say uh, from the outset that what we're about to show you is based on findings that are preliminary at best. We didn't get that. The findings are not, I repeat, not definitive. Data just analyzed by the Space Center's computer suggests that the asteroid 6645 Venturi was approaching the Earth on a, on a precise trajectory for impact at 90 degrees north latitude when it broke up over the polar ice cap. The three debris segments that split apart landed at the following impact points. Uh, zero degrees longitude near Lord France. The other two sites were at 105 degrees west in Wyoming and the same longitude east in Mongolia. Uh, here and here. All three sites were located at 45 degrees north latitude. What, they're, they're <laughs> so, that is all we have at this point. Dale, they broke up over the North Pole and came down in a perfect pattern? That is correct. What does that mean? We made no conclusions at this point. Well, what are the chances that a random asteroid would hit and break up and fall with such precision? No comment. Well, what about the fact that Dr. Avram Mandel is being flown here on an Air Force fighter jet? What about it? Well, you couldn't have gotten him down here any faster if you'd shot him from a cannon. So what's your point? Well, according to his bio, he is a founding member of SETI. Does that mean extraterrestrials were involved? Like I said at the beginning, there are no questions. Come on, Dale, give it well, no. Come on, Come on. Okay, stand by. I'm going to go live here. <clears throat> there you have it, Sandy. Back during the Watergate, they would have called that a non-denial denial. This isn't like NASA. Ever since the Challenger disaster, they've been one of the most open agencies in the government. <clears throat> That's right, Sandy. But as soon as I mentioned SETI, uh, Powell shut right down. SETI was originally a NASA program. Uh, yes, but just last year, their funding was cut. Uh, most of the scientists here are members of SETI. Uh, and as you know, Sandy, uh, SETI is an acronym. It stands for the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Now, these are scientists who are dedicated to the belief that uh, there is life on other planets. Our continuing coverage, Asteroid, Fire from the Sky, will resume after this. Evening World News continues its coverage with Dr. Carolyn Jaffe and Sandra Van Oker. For those of you just joining us, we're tracking the story of a large near-Earth asteroid that broke up over the North Pole tonight and collided with the Earth at three sites in the United States, Europe, and Asia. We'll have more on the damage in a moment. But first, news on two of the survivors. Correspondent Paul Whitaker begins with this live report from Lourdes in southern France. Sandy, rescuers are bringing skier Jean-Paul Chenard down from the mountain where he's been stranded since the asteroid hit earlier this evening. We've been getting reports that his condition is critical. He's uh, semi-comatose and suffering from frostbite and third-degree burns. Getting him down off this mountain has been an incredible task, as you can well imagine, and, and his wife Sylvia is clearly relieved that he's been found alive. She's going to accompany him to the burn center in Nice. We're going to follow this story, and we'll get back to you as soon as we know more. This is Paul Whitaker, Evening World News, reporting from Lourdes. We switch now to Mercy Medical Center in Casper, Wyoming, where correspondent Bree Walker is standing by. Bree? Sandy, a woman called here to the hotline just moments ago and said the little girl is her daughter. The sheriff gave few other details, but did issue a statement confirming the identity of the little girl as eight-year-old Kimberly Hastings of Corrales, New Mexico. Apparently, she had been missing since last Friday. No one knows yet how she got this far north. Corrales is almost 400 miles from where the asteroid hit. Doctors say she is still in critical condition tonight, yet she is one lucky little girl. With the mystery over little Kimberly's identity cleared up, we shift now to a larger question. How is it that an asteroid could break up and fall to Earth with an almost geometric precision? My colleague, science editor Dr. Carolyn Jaffe, has found one astronomer who believes he has the answer. You are looking at the sea of tranquility, a vast stretch of craters created over the centuries when asteroids pockmarked the lunar surface. This shot of the moon was taken through a 158-inch Cassegrain reflector telescope. The man operating it is Dr. Robert Perlman, a Caltech PhD and astronomer who has personally identified a half dozen major comets. Dr. Perlman, what's the significance of tonight's event? 
Well, you see, in, in astronomical terms, tonight's event coming so close to Shoemaker-Levy 9 is really unique in recorded history. We understand that you actually have a photograph of 6645 Venturi taken just before it broke up. Um, this was taken at an elevation of 12,500 miles above the pole. Now, four minutes later, when we attempted to take another plate, the asteroid exploded. Dr. Perlman, Sander Van Oker. Oh, Mr. Van Oker. I understand you're the co-chair with Dr. Avram Mandel of SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. I am. Well, doctor, what do you make of the announcement by NASA that the asteroid fragment struck in precise order? Well, it just confirms what we've been saying for years. I mean, with, with 200 billion stellar systems in the Milky Way galaxy alone, the existence of intelligent life beyond Earth is uh, undeniable. Perhaps, but why jump to that conclusion in this case just because the asteroid fragments hit at the same latitude? Ah, uh, well, that's a very, very good question. Let me see if this... Uh... Yes, yes. Uh, can you see this? Yes, we can. All right. Um, 6645 Venturi approached the Earth on a dead center trajectory for the North Pole. The angles of the three impact sites, A, B, and C, are exactly 45 degrees. Huh. The odds against that happening in nature are something like, go oh, uh, 10 to the 58th power. So, what are you saying? I'm saying that what we've seen tonight is unnatural. Could it happen at random? Not a chance. Oh, thank you, Doctor. That was astronomer Robert Perlman, executive director of the American Observatory in Kitt Peak, Arizona. We need to point out for our viewers the danger of speculation at this point. Because of the breaking events tonight, we're bringing you information that's live and unedited. That's right, Sandy. And viewers should keep that in mind as they watch this next report from Barry Steinbrenner of affiliate KTML in Casper, Wyoming. A 39-year-old crop duster pilot identified as Dwayne Thomas Haskell was questioned by local law enforcement and Air Force officials tonight and later released after reporting a UFO. The alleged incident occurred as he was landing his plane some 40 miles west of Crash Site Alpha near Benson, Wyoming. They ask you about the UFOs, Mr. Haskell. I've already said all I'm going to say. I've already said it. Why were you in there? I told the Air Force people all I know. But why were you in there so long? Get away from my truck! Since Haskell refuses to talk, we tape this interview with Sheriff's Deputy Anson Peters, the first official to speak with Haskell. He told me that he was uh, just coming down at around uh, 6.45 after dusting all day. Anyway, Haskell was shaking. I mean, the man was terrified. He said he was just coming in when this uh, thing appeared on his right-hand side, and it followed him a few hundred feet as he landed, and then it streaked across his windshield, and then the thing took off straight up like a shot. At this point, the pilot Haskell is in seclusion. We checked with the FAA to see if there was anything unusual on radar, and they had no comment. This is Barry Steinbrenner, KTML Action News, Wyoming. Well, we've just learned that Mr. Haskell has sold his story to the National Enquirer. Though he denies it, the full purchase price is believed to be upwards of $100,000. Well, was there really something up there tonight? We took our cameras outside just moments ago to get reactions. Do I believe in UFOs? I don't know. I like the aliens. I like that theory. I have no doubt that it's a UFO. Um, I definitely, definitely don't think it's UFOs. <laughs> well, see, that, that to me is just humans' arrogancy to think that everything can be explained with scientific data and information. I mean, for years we've always assumed that there's no life on other planets. Well, why would they be there? You know, I'm not surprised. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think so. I, I really don't. I don't believe in aliens or something. <laughs> all right. As you know, the White House has been noticeably silent in all this. The president's out of the country at the G7 Economic Summit, and for him that may be a blessing. But there's at least one segment of the administration willing to comment on the alleged UFO incident. We go now to national security correspondent Mark Minetti at the Pentagon. Here with me tonight is the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Advanced Technologies, Dr. Norbert Hazelton. Now, Doctor, with NASA's announcement of how the asteroid fragments came in, I suppose that talk of UFOs was inevitable. Absolutely. They all come out of the woodwork at times like this. All right. Granted, the, the crop duster report has yet to be confirmed, but what about the findings of uh, Dr. Robert Perlman? He's a respected scientist. Look, there's an irresponsible segment of the scientific community that seems bent on proving the existence of little green men, and that's fine. 
The problem is, is that the U.S. has been trying to establish contact for decades to no avail. Seven separate unmanned probes have been launched toward the edge of the galaxy, beaming messages from Earth. There have been more than a, a thousand U.S. space shots alone since the 1950s. Another uh, 2,400 by the Russians. Twelve men landed on the moon and returned without sightings. We wanted to find them. There was nothing. What about the geometric pattern of the crashes? I mean, how could something so precise simply be attributed as a natural phenomenon? Well, I've got just one answer for you. Snowflakes. Hundreds of trillions of them fall to Earth every year, each with an intricate geometric pattern and no two alike. Nature is precise in its randomness, and that is the fascination of it. Thank you, Doctor. Back to you. Sandy, with these allegations of UFO involvement, we shouldn't forget the real story here. That the more than 2,000 near-Earth asteroids still uncharted by NASA represent a significant threat to the Earth. Two years ago, during a football game in Peekskill, New York, fans observed this meteorite streak through the sky where it almost destroyed a residential neighborhood. In 1972, an alert photographer in the Grand Teton National Park caught this object as it streaked across the sky at 33,000 miles an hour. With an estimated weight of one million pounds, it narrowly missed a campground with thousands of people. And in 1989, an asteroid half a mile wide narrowly missed the planet. The Earth had been directly in line with that giant rock only six hours earlier. You're saying that we were only six hours away from <laughs> catastrophe? That's right. Uh, in fact, after that near miss, a congressional report concluded, quote, had the asteroid struck the Earth, it would have caused a disaster unprecedented in human history. Doctor, as you know, while government officials continue to insist that tonight's asteroid hits were of natural origin, there's a growing segment of the population who sense something more. And joining us now is Terrence Freeman, author of the recent bestseller, Messengers from Beyond. Mr. Freeman, welcome. Glad to be here, Sandy. Uh, Mr. Freeman, you've long been a proponent of the theory that intelligent life has visited Earth before, correct? Oh, there's no question. There are ancient cave drawings showing figures in space helmets. Uh, the pyramids, the enormous figures on Easter Island, even the circle at Stonehenge were all built at a time before we had the technical skills to create them. I'm sorry, Mr. Freeman, but you, you seem to be denying all human achievement. Oh, on the contrary, men and women accomplished these things, but they were guided by forces on high. It's axiomatic. You can trace the benchmarks throughout history. They come every few hundred years, and we are long overdue. Well, there are plenty of responsible scientists who would argue that these asteroids are long overdue. You know, there's a dictum that scientists are taught to follow. It says that when you are faced with an enigma, uh, the best explanation is usually the simplest and most logical one. In this case, asteroids, not Forgive aliens. Me, I've got to interrupt you both. We've just received a disturbing report from correspondent Robert Marino. He's now on the ground near impact uh, site Alpha in Wyoming. It? Robert? Sandy, two events in the last 10 minutes have put the asteroid impact in a chilling new light. First, our new chopper and about a half a dozen other aircraft were forced to land when an intense radio signal began jamming our navigational system. Then after we hit the ground, we began to hear that noise in the background. A loud, pulsating hum coming from the direction of the meteor crater. The decibel has increased minute by minute to the point where you almost have to scream to be heard. Bob, can you get any closer to the I'm rim sorry. of the crater? Can you get can any closer, closer to the rim of the crater? Right. Uh, you can hear the sound of increase as we move towards the crater. It's, it's eerie. It's a sound unlike anything I've ever heard before. And it is loud. It's, uh... They're painful. In fact, it's, it's absolutely happening. It's, it's, you can hear me for this, but it's terrible. I can't take it anymore. The AP is reporting that state police units as far away as Casper, Wyoming, have been picking up that same loud hum on their radios. And there's this statement just in from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, quote, a persistent audio signal of unknown origin on the edge of the FM band is being emitted from the vortex of the crater, unquote. In other words, that apparently benign piece of space rock is charged electronically and sending out some sort of signal. Matt Jensen has more from Houston. Officials here at the Johnson Space Center have confirmed that similar radio signals have now been detected, emanating from the Bravo and Charlie impact sites in southern France and in the Gobi Desert of Mongolia. There's no official word from NASA, but sources here say that the signals could be natural in origin, the result of what is being described as, quote, a pulsating charged ion field. 
which developed during the parent asteroid's flight through the atmosphere. We repeat, at this juncture, the word is that the signals are of uh, natural origin. Back to you. There's some activity at the FAA's Air Traffic System Command in Washington, D.C. We go there now with correspondent Mike Curtis. Caroline, I'm standing in the Aviation Command Center, where authorities have now confirmed that signals emanating from the asteroid sites have begun to disrupt commercial air traffic. With me now is Facility Manager David Case. David, are you able to shed any light on this situation for us? Well, tra uh, traffic has been disrupted across the country, but as you can see on the screen behind me, uh, the problem is most acute at O'Hare in Chicago, uh, Wayne County Airport in Detroit, and the three New York City hubs, Newark, JFK, and LaGuardia. Uh, Mr. Case, this is Carolyn Jaffe. 45 degrees north is the very same parallel where the asteroid fragment struck. Yes, ma'am? You have any comment on that? Uh, no, I'm afraid I have nothing to say about that at this time. Uh, if you'll excuse me, I have to get back to work. This is Mike Curtis reporting live. Back to you, Caroline. Thanks, Mike. In a moment, we hope to have more on those mysterious radio signals. We stress again, we don't yet know the full significance of all this, but one thing is clear. An event that began some 95 minutes ago with few human casualties has now grown into an international air crisis affecting thousands. Our continuing coverage, Asteroid Fire from the Sky, will return in a moment. Here, once again, are Dr. Carolyn Jaffe and Sandra Van Oker. For those of you just joining us now, we are following an ever-widening crisis touched off by the impact tonight of a massive meteor that broke up and fell to Earth. Radio signals from the three impact sites are affecting air traffic worldwide, and FAA officials are recommending that people fly tonight only if it's absolutely necessary. We go now to one of the city's hardest hit. Correspondent Ernie Anastas is in New York. They come here to Times Square, as they always do when the world is in trouble. The Cuban Missile Crisis, the Kennedy assassination, the war in the Gulf, all recorded up on that sign. When you want to take the pulse speed of the planet, few places can give you a reading like New York. Ever since the meteor shower started several hours ago, things we take for granted have been affected. Officials at Newark Airport are reporting delays of up to three hours. The situation is worse at LaGuardia, and the two runways at JFK have been completely shut down. All New York-bound air traffic was diverted to Boston and Hartford as interference from the three impact sites continues to scramble radar. The only planes moving at LaGuardia were outgoing flights. The resulting gridlock at airports has produced massive traffic jams. This is the Holland Tunnel tonight, and as you can see, traffic backed up with thousands leaving the city by car. Others abandoned their vehicles and rushed into the tunnel trying to get out of the city on foot. New York City 911 Emergency Center is overloaded now and running on backup generators at this hour. The police and fire departments have called in all off-duty personnel during the crisis. And finally, hundreds of people of all denominations jam St. Patrick's Cathedral tonight for a prayer vigil conducted by Terrence Cardinal O'Connell. So, Sandy, here we are at the foot of the tower where the ball drops every New Year's Eve. And if we had stood here last December 31st, looking ahead to 1994, I assure you that no one would have predicted this. Ernie Anastas, Evening World News, New York. As money markets open now in Asia, there are reports that trading has been suspended on the Hong Kong and Tokyo markets. Scattered power outages have been reported throughout Europe and Asia. But for the most part, people are staying calm, just watching and waiting to see if the unthinkable is possible. Could intelligent life exist elsewhere outside our solar system? And if so, do they have the capability of visiting Earth? Doctor? Sandy, America is a country that thrives on conspiracy. The very word cover-up is part of our national lexicon, and for close to five decades now, tens of thousands of Americans have been convinced of two things, that there is something out there and the government doesn't want us to know. The UFO era began in 1947 when a sheep rancher in Roswell, New Mexico, found fragments of what he said was a flying disc. Later, the Air Force called it a weather balloon, but a secret government report made public years later described the recovery of four tiny bodies from the Roswell crash site. And ever since then, there have been hundreds of reported sightings. However, the Air Force shut down Project Blue Book, concluding, quote, no evidence has been found that any of the UFO reports reflect a threat to our national security. Well, there's science fact and there's science fiction. To help separate the two, we go now to a man who spent years studying the threat from these massive meteors. Arthur C. Clarke, the noted author of 2001 and dozens of other books, was recently nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. 
He joins us now live from his home in Colombo, Sri Lanka. Dr. Clark, thanks for being with us. My pleasure. Dr. Clark, as far back as 1973, in your book, Rendezvous with Rama, you wrote about the threat from near-Earth asteroids. Isn't that right? That's correct. There are those who believe tonight's impacts may have some connection to extraterrestrials. What's your view? Well, I believe there's plenty of intelligent life out there in space. But actual visitors, very unlikely, despite the claims of the UFO enthusiasts. Why is that? Well, we've been sending out radio, radar, signals for 50 years. They now fill a volume of space 100 light years across. But we haven't had any reply. Well, UFO advocates would say that you have had replies, but that the government just isn't telling. A nonsense. I'd give any saucer gate about 24 hours to unravel. And apart from the broadcast transmissions, NASA has made attempts to send messages to any possible civilization in space using the Voyager space probes. I understand you have a copy there of the disk they sent out on Voyager 2. Yes, a record like this, carrying pictures and messages from the peoples of Earth and from the United Nations. Well, if they're out there and we sent them a beacon, so to speak, why wouldn't they answer? I'm afraid it's a function of time and space. The distance between advanced civilizations may be thousands of light years. So even if they were traveling at the speed of light, it might take them several millennia to get here. But just for the sake of argument, say it was possible. All right, then the question is why bother to come here? For the Earth to be chosen, we must assume we're rather special. But looking at the primitive state of our civilization, I think that's very conceited. So what are you saying? Well, there's a much bigger issue at stake. The need to protect ourselves against rogue asteroids, which are very real and pose a much bigger threat to Earth. Thank you, Dr. Clark. That was scientist and author Arthur C. Clark speaking to us from Sri Lanka. We go to Lourdes, France, where correspondent Paul Whitaker has an update on the condition of Jean-Paul Junard, the French skier who survived the second impact. I'm here at Julian Airport near Lourdes, France, where just moments ago doctors airlifted Jean-Paul Chouinard to the Colombert Burn Center in Nice. We spoke to Chouinard's wife, Sylvie, just moments Madame before Chouinard. they departed. No, come back now. What is your husband's condition, please? Uh, um, he, uh, he was trying to tell me, uh, I don't know, maybe how he survived. I just don't know. But um, Jean-Paul is strong and... You will not give up. C'est tout, je m'en In the meantime, Air France has suspended all flights in and out of Rome, where these bizarre radio signals threaten to paralyze one of Europe's busiest airports. This is Paul Whitaker, Evening World News, Julian Airport near Lourdes, France. Wyoming police have widened the area of evacuation to some 200 miles around impact site Alpha. And we're about to go live to correspondent Robert Marino near... No, I'm sorry, we're not going there, we're not. We've just received word of an unscheduled briefing at the White House. Correspondent Mike Curtis is standing by. Mike? Sandy, a formal briefing had been scheduled for 11 p.m. tonight to coincide with local news broadcasts. But moments ago, the White House press corps was summoned here for what's being described as a high-priority briefing. Press Secretary Barbara Schiller, uh, that must be her now. Barbara? Barbara? Um... Uh. Earlier tonight, uh, following the impact of three meteor fragments, President Clinton directed NASA to begin around-the-clock monitoring of all near-Earth asteroids with the potential of penetrating the atmosphere. At approximately 9.17 p.m., the Air Force's geodes tracking stations at Socorro, New Mexico, Maui, Hawaii, and Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean uh, detected the presence of what appears to be a second asteroid. At 65 meters or 200 feet in length, it is on a trajectory almost identical to the path of 6645 Venturi. The radio telescope at Arecibo, Puerto Rico locked on and they confirm that the object is heading toward the Earth at an airspeed of 32,000 miles per hour. The expected impact in the area of the polar ice cap is some five minutes from now. At 9.52 p.m. Eastern Time, the President and Joint Chiefs of Staff ordered units of the 388th Fighter Wing from Hill Air Force Base to U in Utah to a full alert. A pair of F-16 fighters from the 18th Space Surveillance Squadron were ordered into the air on a Defense Condition 2 status. The planes are armed with Hawk optically guided missiles capable of destroying the asteroid before impact. Uh, these missiles are tipped with two kiloton low-yield nuclear warheads. 
The, uh, the F-16s are expected to be in target range at approximately 1016 is four minutes from now. Barbara, Barbara, uh, Barbara, yes, Barbara. Um, Mario, yes. Barbara, how can the president possibly justify the use of nuclear weapons? Uh, well, a panel from the National Academy of Sciences met tonight, and their conclusion was that if the asteroid penetrated the ice cap, then the consequences to the Earth's ecological balance could be absolutely catastrophic. So, uh, some kind of you know, the what about the radio signals jamming air traffic? How will that affect the F-16's launch? Uh, it is our understanding that the traffic is affected only along the 45th parallel? Yes. 45th parallel. Yes, Michelle. Did the president consult Congress? Uh, the president did speak with leaders of both houses earlier this evening. And what about other world leaders? Uh, Russian President Boris Yeltsin and Chinese Premier Deng Xiaoping have been informed. Both leaders have expressed their consent, as has the chairman of the UN Security Council. Let me just wait. Let me just tell you one other thing, and that is that the missile hardware uh, that is to be used is identical to that which was deployed so successfully in the Gulf War. That's all that we have. To There's word just in that the event will be monitored live at the Johnson Space Center. They're deciding whether or not to give the media access to the feed. But NASA, which has been quite quiet throughout much of this crisis, now seems to be opening up. Matt Jensen's live in Houston. Why the sudden turnaround? Sandy, no one here wants to openly break ranks with the White House or the Pentagon. But there are a number of scientists who are unsure about the use of nuclear weapons. Among them, Dr. Kurt Loudon, who we spoke with earlier. Uh, doctor, what is your concern? Simply this. With an incoming projectile moving at 50 times the speed of sound, a close quarters air engagement may be quite ineffective. Also, the prospect of a nuclear burst over the ice cap may produce consequences even more dire for the Earth's, for the Earth's ecology. Ladies and gentlemen, the point being, Sam, uh, NASA will be monitoring U.S. Strategic Command off at Air Force Base Omaha, Nebraska. We will be listening to the voice of Air Force Launch Control Officer Major Scotty Powers. You will be allowed to stay. That was Dale Powell, the uh, Director of Community Relations here for NASA. He has just told the press that we will be allowed to stay here in the Operations Center uh, where they will be monitoring the F-16s. So we'll be back when the missiles are ready to be launched. Doctor, there's late word from New York where the United Nations Security Council has gone into special session. Correspondent Ernie Anastas is outside UN headquarters. Excuse me, could you tell me why you're here tonight? To let the world leaders know that if we are being visited, the asteroids represent some kind of contact and the world should respond in peace. Ambassador, what action will the Council take? In the event of the unthinkable, and these are indeed extraterrestrials, we'll uh, try and formulate an agenda for receiving them. Personally, I don't care if it's asteroids or aliens. The most important thing is to keep our families safe, keep our homes safe. If they come to Brooklyn, we'll know what to do. And I come down here with my boys from SUNY College. Figure maybe we could find us some enemies, smack some heads. Why so hostile? You kidding me? I got a brother flies for the airlines. Now, if these things are messing with air traffic, we got to stop them. The two fighters that took off from Hill Air Force Base in Utah will be designated Interceptor 1 and Interceptor 2. We go back now to Mission Control at the Johnson Space Center. <clears throat> Sandy, we're at T minus 52 seconds and counting here. You'll be seeing three pictures up on that active matrix display. On the furthest screen is a feed from the tracking station at Socorro, New Mexico, showing the incoming asteroid. Uh, the middle screen will be a graphic showing the two F-16s and the asteroid in relation to the North Pole. And the image on the far left is from a camera uh, mounted in the cockpit of Interceptor 1. T minus 30 seconds. That's Major Scotty Powers, the Air Force Launch Control Officer. Naval warheads. Warhead enabled. Confirm. Lock on guidance. Roger. Radar lock. Two's locked. Prepare to fire, then egress left. Clear to fire in three, two, one. Engage. Come on home, boys. Ten Roger, seconds to contact. Eight, seven. What the hell was that? Six. I too, Johnny. Five. Negative. We're losing video on India One. <laughs> India Two. Do you copy? <laughs> we have contact. Oh, it, seems like, it seems India like we've one, had a direct India hit on the copy. asteroid, but there's two. Do you copy? there's some Switch concern here six. that we've lost yeah, the yeah, image of the cockpit. You copy. Say again. Okay, now we've lost each other. Both India One and India Two. India One. India Two. What happened to the image here on the cockpit? I have no comment. I don't know. Sorry. 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 Sorry.
At 10.16 p.m., some four seconds before the asteroid was destroyed, the transponder signals from the two F-16s went off boys. the radar screens. At the same time, the sounds we've been hearing from the craters were heard in the F-16's transmission. The two pilots, Air Force Captain Charles Reichheiser, 32, and Major John Pastorelli, 36, both of Hill Air Force Base, are missing and presumed dead. The nuclear submarine, USS Houston, which surfaced at the polar ice cap, has reported seeing debris consistent with the afterburner of an F-16. Search teams are racing to the scene from Gander, Newfoundland. Now to the Pentagon, where the Air Force is about to conduct a briefing on what they're calling defensive engagement with the meteor. The postmortem will be handled by Deputy Undersecretary of Defense Norbert Hazelton and General Lucian Alexander, U.S. Air Force Ladies Chief of Staff. Let me say at the outset that we are deeply grieved over the loss of two outstanding Air Force pilots. But they gave their lives so that we can stand here tonight and report a near-perfect mission profile. I want to stress that the warhead loads were extremely low yield. Any trace radiation should dissipate in the atmosphere within a matter of days. All radio signals from Wyoming, France, and Mongolia have ceased once again. There is every reason to believe that what the people of the Earth experienced was a natural phenomenon. General Alexander, General, General Alexander, how, how can you attribute this to natural phenomenon when we all saw the glow inside the cockpit? Just a lens flare. At air speeds like that, with the light conditions over the pole, the cockpit array throws off a number of video spikes. Okay, but wait, what, what, what about the trajectory? All right, come on, 6645 Venturi and the same asteroid, the latest one, they were on the identical path. Not surprising, it's not surprising. It's quite possible they were both part of the same source asteroid. No, no. The pieces simply split in deep space and came in online. I'll tell you one thing, ladies and gentlemen. If there was ever an argument for jump-starting the anti-missile defense shield, this is it. We were lucky tonight. Good shooting, great hardware. The next time, it might be a different story. Next time, Jennifer? What do you that anti-missile shield the general was talking about, of course, is the Star Wars system, a favorite of President Reagan's, put on the shelf when President Clinton came into power. Sandy, the Air Force F-16 jet carrying Dr. Avram Mandel has touched down in Houston. Uh, he's about to arrive at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, and Matt Jensen is there live. Matthew? Yeah, Carolyn, any minute now, that door behind me will open, and a man who has been something of an enigma in all this will arrive and speak with me. Wait, there he is. You have a comment. The action of the Pentagon is frankly unforgivable. There is a force behind these asteroids that is clearly intelligent. The fact that they chose to land first in unpopulated areas demonstrates clearly that they meant us no harm. The, the radio signal was acting merely as a sort of transponder to help steer the second vehicle in. But the second vehicle is... Come crashing down first. Listen to me, people. The, the entire notion of a flying saucer is a fiction. It's a fiction. They took the form that they wanted to take. They came in the way that they chose to come, in peace at first. Well, what are you saying, Doctor? What I'm saying is that we have made a preemptive strike, people. We have just declared war. It's clear that Dr. Mandel is quite emotional. And as soon as we have details of his meeting here, we'll be back. This is Matt Jensen, Evening World News at the Johnson Space Center. An Evening World News telephone poll suggests that more than two-thirds of the public now believes that the asteroids are connected to alien life forms. It has been a night filled with charges and countercharges, but we would be remiss as journalists if we didn't separate fact from allegation. To the best of anyone's knowledge, at this point, the giant meteors that came to Earth tonight were of natural origin. All right. Um, with the radio signals now silent, Robert Marino is live from Faith, a Wyoming town less than 50 miles from the impact site Alpha. Robert. I'm here in Faith, an old religious community dating back to the mid-19th century. The town is well outside the evacuation zone. There were no reported casualties or incidents after the nearby impact. Then, after the meteor explosion at the North Pole, Wyoming Edison detected an unusual power surge here. They sent a repair crew out to inspect, and when they got here, this is what they found. Sandy, the streets are deserted. Everybody has vanished. Men, women, children, cats and dogs. I mean, cars are left in the middle of the streets, and except for the National Guardsmen, there isn't a soul here. The town is completely empty, frozen in time. The sidewalks are strewn with trick-or-treat bags, as if the children had simply dropped them as they left. I, I don't know what else to say. 
It's eerie. Air National Guard Sergeant Leroy Diggs told us he was a forward recon in Desert Storm, but that he never saw anything like this. It's like they got swallowed up. We did a full house-to-house, -house, checked for radiation, toxic emissions. We got nothing. I'm telling you, there's no way to explain this. The rescue workers are even using motion detectors set to pick up the smallest movement, but there's nothing. In a town where 3,000 people live, work, and go to school, everyone is simply gone. As soon as we have any word on what happened here, we'll be back. But for now, this is a ghost town. This is Robert Marino, Faith, Wyoming. A rather sad note from France. Paul Whitaker reports from outside the Colombier Burn Center in Nice, where it's now morning. It's 6.43 a.m. Greenwich time here, Sandy, and doctors have just sent word that Jean-Paul Chouinard, the French skier they plucked off the mountain, has died. He regained consciousness briefly before succumbing to injuries sustained when the asteroid hit, and doctors were able to get a recording of his last words here. Fearing that it would be exploited by the tabloid press, his widow Sylvie has requested that it be released to the networks. Evening World News continuing coverage will resume in a moment. Continuing our coverage in the aftermath of three enormous meteor fragments that struck the Earth tonight, we go first to correspondent Mike Curtis at the FAA's Air Traffic System Command in Washington, D.C. Radio signals from the three impact sites may have stopped, but aviation authorities report ticket counters jammed at airports nationwide. This is Baltimore Washington International. Most airlines report delays of up to three hours as dozens of flights are being diverted there. Sandy, this is a continental light market, and fortunately, the people at this end of the terminal are able to get out because these flights are still taking off. Authorities say it may be morning before traffic returns to normal. This is Mike Curtis at the Aviation Command Center, Washington, D.C. Meanwhile, correspondent Warren Olney has news on the final words of French skier Jean-Paul Chouinard. He's outside NASA's Goldstone facility in the Mojave Desert. Warren? Carolyn, in this breaking story that seems to take a different turn every minute, we have just learned that the last words of Jean-Paul Chouinard are being analyzed here by NASA's computers. They're checking for any similarities between Chouinard's incomprehensible speech pattern and that of eight-year-old Kimberly Hastings, who, of course, was found more than 6,000 miles away. We'll have more on this when we get it. Now back to you. We have an update now on little Kimberly Hastings, the eight-year-old girl found wandering near impact site Alpha. Bree Walker is at Mercy Medical Center in Casper, Wyoming. Bree? Finally, some good news to report as little Kimberly's condition is upgraded from critical to stable. Doctors are still not able to get through to her verbally, so there's no way to know what, if anything, she remembers from the asteroid crash. As to how she got to the impact site, when Donna Hastings, her mother, arrived at the hospital just moments ago, she was mobbed by media, wanting to know the answer to that question. How did Kimberly get to Wyoming? Daddy, I got a court order to keep him away, but he didn't care about it. Come on, tell us give us a break. Tell us more. Tell us more. Tell us more. Three days ago, he went off to daycare, and he just up and took her from me. But why so far from home? Come on, we're in here. He said he was going to go to Canada. Kimberly, you're the late from the network, right? You're the one who found Kimber? What's your name? What's your name? so much. She's so pissed me to see you. Donna. Donna. Let's go. Sandy, Dr. Robert Perlman, the astronomer we interviewed earlier, has done a computer analysis of the first three impact sites. He's joining us now live from his lab at the American Observatory in Kitt Peak, Arizona. Dr. Perlman, can you hear me? Yes, thanks. This is a 3D model of 6645 Venturi as it came to Earth. It breaks up at a point some 6,500 miles above 90 degrees north latitude, which is the true North Pole. You can see the three fragments falling to their impact sites, designated Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie. As I connect the trajectories, you will see what looks like a diamond-shaped pyramid with its apex above the pole. The angles on impact are exactly 45 degrees. Uh, forgive me, Dr. Perlman, but that looks remarkably like the line drawing you showed us earlier. What's so new about this model? Well, it will become relevant when I show you this. Now, this is an exact reproduction of a pixelated message that was sent out in 1973 on Pioneer 11. Here you will see symbols for man, the solar system, the DNA double helix, which is the basic molecule of life, and a figure representing the Pioneer spacecraft itself. 
You will note the upside down pyramid. Now watch. It's unmistakable. The asteroid fragments represented a symbol. They were using the descent vectors to send us a message. That's an intriguing theory, Dr. Perman, but I'm sure you'll agree it's subject to debate. Of course. We've invited Dr. Norbert Hazleton to join us. He's Deputy Undersecretary of Defense, and if you don't mind, he has some questions. Not at all. Fire away, Dr. Hazleton. Dr. Perlman, if I understand you correctly, you're saying that aliens visited Earth tonight? Uh, no, no, I said it was possible. Come, come, you brought in Pioneer, you've uh, matched a couple of triangles. What are you saying? Well, if you put it like that point blank, yes, it sounds improbable. But consider what happened tonight. The pattern of the impact sites, the radio signals, survivors speaking in tongues, an entire town missing? Forgive me, Doctor. This isn't some Trekkie convention. There are millions of people in the world right now panicking needlessly. Yes, and I would like to know how much that has to do with the hair-trigger response of the Pentagon. Me, Doctor. If you can show me aliens in those triangles, I'll give you the second gunman on the grassy knoll. Listen, you know as well as I do that the scientific community is divided on this, but you people, you people see this as an opportunity to hotwire Star Wars, and it shouldn't come down to that. There is much more at stake here. You're damn right there is. Gentlemen, I'm sorry, but we've run out of time. You've just heard from astronomer Robert Perlman and Deputy Undersecretary of Defense Norbert Hazelton. And now to recap, the Earth was rocked tonight by three separate fragments from an enormous meteor that landed in the United States, Europe, and Asia. A second meteor on a direct path with the first one was shot down by U.S. planes using nuclear weapons over the North Pole. The two pilots in that mission perished. After radio signals from the three meteor fragments began jamming air traffic worldwide, civil unrest broke out in a number of countries with some speculating that the asteroids may have a connection to extraterrestrials. That issue has fractured the scientific community. While the sole survivor of the asteroid impact in Wyoming, an eight-year-old girl remains hospitalized, unable to speak. President Clinton is now jetting back to Washington aboard Air Force One. He's scheduled an address to the nation when he lands at Andrews Air Force Base at 11.16 p.m., Eastern time. Forgive me, Sandy, but Dr. Avram Mandel, the SETI scientist rushed to the Johnson Space Center, has just emerged from a meeting with NASA officials. He's talking with reporters right now, and we pick up his comments in progress. No, 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 I'm, I'm way past that. But why do this here? Because I'm no longer speaking as a staff scientist at NASA. Effective at 9.32 p.m. Central Time, I have resigned my position. As a concerned astronomer, and most importantly, as a human being, I can no longer associate myself with the government's handling of this ongoing crisis. Look, look. We were given a gift tonight, people. We had a visitation. They came in peace, and we answered them with 2,000 tons of TNT at the end of a nuclear warhead. Now, what if this had been Jesus, or, or Buddha, or Mohammed, or, or a prophet of old? I mean, haven't we learned anything from history? I mean, we all know that we have the most violent planet in the galaxy, but why? In God's name, why did we have to take it to them? Look, Doctor, you're upset. Why don't we, why don't we do this the right no, way? No, I, I wanted to do this the right way, Dale. That's why I flew out here. I tried to plead with these people, and it didn't do any good. Dr. Mandel, you mentioned before that this is an ongoing crisis. What did you mean by that? You don't know? No. You mean they haven't told you anything? Look, the they doctor is clearly disturbed. Dale, Dale, Bobby, Dale, don't you do you this. This is not responsible. Dale, I am responsible to myself now. I'm so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. At approximately 10.32 p.m. Eastern Time, the radio telescope hit, um, at Goldstone, Mojave, received a signal. Air Force tracking stations locked on as well. There are three asteroids of a magnitude of two miles each and above that are on a trajectory with Earth. They are headed directly toward three of the Earth's most populous cities, Beijing in the People's Republic of China, Moscow, as well as Washington, D.C. Why those cities, Doctor? I don't know. I can only guess, and that is that they are the capitals of the only three nations on this planet who have a first-strike nuclear threat. The, um, the asteroids are expected to hit sometime around 10.52 p.m. Eastern Time. That's, that's nine minutes from now. We declared war against them people we did it and now they've just decided to respond so may god have mercy on us all 
Our coverage of this continuing crisis will resume after this. From now on, we'll stay on the air continuously until this crisis is over. As we count down now to the moment of impact, the mayors of the nation's 10 largest cities have all imposed curfews. Looting is widespread amid fears of food shortages as the crisis deepens. Meanwhile, the radio signals at all three impact sites have resumed. This time, they're affecting not only commercial air traffic, but radio and TV signals across the globe. In many countries, telephone service is out. The reaction in this country has been panic. And hopefully everything's going to be okay, but I just don't know what I'm going to do when it happens. Well, as of, as of right now, I'm not really frightened because, I mean, I, really, I, I haven't seen them, and, I mean, they haven't really come after me, but if they start coming after me, yeah, I'm going to be scared. I got to get out of here. My family's waiting for me. Now I've been to Liga. They fight here. I'm not a religious person. I haven't been to Mass in years, but I came tonight. Sandy, there are reports of panic worldwide as fears begin to mount. As you can see here, the French police are having no success in trying to calm the people who are rioting. While in Washington and other cities around the world, the fear is being expressed in candlelight vigils and other peaceful gatherings. No one seems to know what to do or where to go. No place is safe as we realize the magnitude of this crisis. People take to the streets in different ways, but one thing is clear. Racial and national boundaries are disappearing as the world reacts to a greater danger. The best advice anyone can give at this point is to get inside a building, move to the basement, and stay there. In the event broadcast stations lose power, turn to the emergency broadcast network at AM 640 or FM 102.4. We begin with a series of reports from evening world news correspondents. This is Paul Collingwood in Moscow. It's 6.40 in the morning here, and Red Square is completely deserted. Even during the darkest days of the Cold War, when the U.S. nuclear arsenal was aimed at this city, you never felt such palpable fear. This is not a religious country, but this morning, the churches and synagogues are filled. This is Michael Curtis reporting from Washington, a city normally associated with great power. But tonight, all anybody really feels is powerless. Some people have gone home to be with their families. Some are in transit trying to get out of this city, but a group of people have gathered here to be together at the feet of a great man who once saved this union, perhaps in the hope that he might somehow do it again. What would you do if you were told you only had seven minutes to live? Or maybe it's just a strange attraction we have for witnessing natural disasters. Tidal waves, great fires, or this, asteroids falling to Earth. Whatever the reason is, all we can really do is wait and watch and pray. This is Denise Wong reporting in Beijing, where an eerie calm has set in after hours of fierce fighting between riot police and angry student demonstrators. Now people simply want to be with their families, and we can understand why. All services are reported shut down. Hospitals are overflowing. Uh, there's word of a massive fire raging through Shanghai with no apparatus or firefighters to stop it. If this is your last day on Earth, you want to spend it with the people you love. Denise Wong, Evening World News in Beijing. You know, Carolyn, at a time like this, you can't help but feel for our correspondents elsewhere. You know, Denise Wong has got a husband and two children up in San Francisco. Yes, the threat is imminent, of course, to the cities that we've just mentioned. But if the asteroids hit Earth, as feared, the entire planet will be impacted. Matt Jensen is standing by as he has been all night at the Johnson Space Center. Matthew? Carolyn, as you can see behind me, many of the scientists here at the Operations Center have gone home to be with their families. Of the few that remain, Dr. Kurt Loudon. Doctor, we've been told that if even one of these asteroids impacts is expected, the effect worldwide could be apocalyptic. Could you elaborate? Yeah, just like the KT event 65 million years ago. If an asteroid one mile or larger strikes on land, it'll throw up enough debris to create what amounts to a nuclear winter. Uh, if, if we can see the screens behind us, you can see the three asteroids as they proceed on target. They are now some 11,000 miles from Earth, but closing fast. With five minutes and counting until the asteroids break the Earth's atmosphere, late word from the Pentagon that there's a plan in place to meet them head on. General uh, Lucian Alexander is briefing the reporters. Air Force Space Command and the U.S. Navy are preparing to counter the threat with nuclear weapons directed by the most advanced guidance system, each carrying 10 independently targetable re-entry vehicles. They'll be launched 
from the Trident Submarine USS Ohio in the North Sea and from F.E. Warren Air Force Base in Cheyenne, Wyoming. The Soviets and the Chinese have agreed not to respond for fear of an all-out nuclear exchange. This peacekeeper and Trident D-5 devices will hit their targets and take them out with surgical precision and minimum collateral damage. In your defense, can nuclear missiles be against UFOs? We still have no definitive proof of alien life forms. There's every likelihood that these asteroids are the result of a media shower of massive proportions. The point is, either we cut and run or we stand and fight. We're now at DEFCON 1, T minus three minutes and count. You know, Carolyn, in the midst of a story like this, when you're talking about millions of lives being affected, I can't help but think of one, Kimberly Hastings in Wyoming. We go now to Bree Walker at Mercy Medical Center in Wyoming. With all the hope in this room just moments ago, I don't quite know how to say this. Shortly after we spoke to you, little Kimberly Hastings collapsed and went into cardiac arrest. A crash team rushed in, but they, at 8.51 p.m., little Kimberly Hastings passed away. And whatever it is that she knew about that asteroid went with her. We are now less than three minutes from the first impact in the People's Republic. Um, I just want to say something. To uh, Lindsay, my little girl. She's six. She had a she had a tooth out last week. The uh, tooth fairy brought her a silver dollar. Honey, I want you to know that mommy loves you very much. I want you and daddy. You hold each other real, real tight. You know how much I love you both. I'm just going to finish up here. And we're all going to be together real soon. Okay. Carolyn, you don't have to stay here. You don't. Let's, um, let's just see it through. You sure? We're now less than two minutes before the Air Force launches its Peacekeeper missiles. We'll be live via satellite with correspondent Denise Wong in Beijing, Paul Collingwood in Moscow, and Mike Curtis here in the nation's capital. And now for the launch phase, we go to Matt Jensen at the Johnson Space Center. Sandy, the radio signals that you hear and that are coming through our headsets are coming off the feed from Impact Site Alpha. The sound is ear piercing. I'm gonna have to do the rest of this with headphones. It's okay, Matt. Uh, we can hear you now. <clears throat> the asteroids have now been, been designated X-ray, Yankee, and Zulu. It's XYZ. In a few seconds, you'll be able to see them hurtling down towards Earth at four to 5,000 miles an hour. The missile exchange will be monitored by tracking stations in Maui, Socorro, and in Diego Garcia. Attention all stations. Status green alert. That voice you're hearing is Stand Major Scotty Powers, count. the launch control officer. Combat crew initiate execute launch command on my mark in 10 seconds. His voice is from the U.S. Strategic Command, Offutt Air Force Base in Omaha, Nebraska. Five, four, three, two, one. Launcher closure open. Missile away. Attention Denise Wong, Beijing is target one. Impact expected at 40 seconds from now. Uh, the radio interference is too strong. Do you see anything at all? Um, you're breaking up, Sandy. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to take a headset off. I think you were asking if I saw anything. The answer is no, not yet. I can't tell you I'm scared. Impact over China at T-minus 15. We've 14, lost the audio, 13, but I assume that's a picture 12, of her husband, Greg, 11, and her two 10, children, Tisha and Mallory. 8, I said before, they all 7, live in San Francisco. 6, 5, Denise, 4, please hold on 3, if you can. 2, 1. We've lost contact with Denise Wong in Beijing. Matt Jensen, can you tell us the status from where you are? Well, by the cheering behind me, I'm sure you can tell we've had total incineration on X-ray. But it is far from over yet. We believe the first asteroid has been destroyed. We go now to Paul Collingwood in Moscow. Paul, what's it look like where you are? Nothing so far, Sandy. Just um, the same piercing signal in my headset. Sandy, for the record, I'm a four-year correspondent. And we're all proud of you, Paul, and your colleagues. And tomorrow would have been my 28th birthday. 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, I love you, Mom and Dad. 7, 6, 5, 4, 3... Two, one. 
Cindy, what happened? They should have impacted by now. Paul, it looks like we've destroyed two out of three now. Mike Curtis at the Lincoln Memorial. Attention all stations around Robin Onsula. Uh, Sandy, it's really impossible to see anything tonight. It's uh, it's so overcast all night long. Impact over Washington in 15. Oh my God. 14. Now, now, now I see it. It's so bright and, and it's coming in fast. They've uh, got the count. The, it's it's getting too close, Sandy. Why aren't they shooting at this thing now? It, God. How does it feel out there? It feels F fabulous. <laughs> it's like the day the wall went down. Yeah. Happy birthday, Paul. Happy birthday, Paul. Oh, thank you, Sandy. Sandy. Thank you, Denise. We're going to go home now. I'd say you've earned it. Thanks for a job well done. Thank you very much. Have a very thank good you. day. Have a good day. Reaction from around the world is typical of this live footage we're seeing right now. But well, before we sign off, correspondent Warren Olney has some information for us from Goldstone. Sandy, the scientists here have deciphered the speech patterns of Kimberly Hastings and John Paul Shunar. Here's the feed now. Has set Hundred and forty seven member states. Wait a minute. That's the recorded message we sent up in Voyager two. Sandy, there's a report from the Johnson Space Center. Matt Jensen is there with a uh, comes to us live. Matt? Carolyn, as you can see, the elation in the room behind me has stopped. People were cheering and celebrating, and then it was as if a balloon would burst. The quiet permeated the room and nobody seems to be giving any indication why. Matt, what is it? Matt, what do you see? Just tell him. Tell us what you're seeing, Matt. The cam. What's the what, what, What's the cameraman's name? I'm told his name is Patrick. Patrick. Patrick, just move the camera to the screen. Show us what you're sh seeing on the screen. Patrick, do you read? Show us what's on, on the screen. Track trajectories. No, there's too many. There's too many to calculate. Now, my okay. friends, this is Houston. Friends, do you copy? Friends, this is Houston. Come in, please. Do you copy? Mexico City, this is Houston. Mexico City, do you copy? Do you read? Please change frequencies and copy. Mexico City, now in stage three. Now in stage three. Come in, London, this is here. London, do you read me? This is Houston. London, if you're there, please answer. Anchorage reports Juno has been destroyed. Beijing, Beijing, this is Houston. Beijing, do you copy? Beijing, please come in. If you can hear the sound of my voice, please come in. Beijing, Socorro, please come in. Obviously, we'll stay on as long as we can. And we'll keep feeding you the signal from the Johnson Space Center as long as possible. With all the missiles and all the power. I can only leave you with this thought from Shakespeare. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. Cape Town, Cape Town, Washington, Washington, this is Houston, Washington, do you read? Washington, this is Houston Control, please come in. Come in, Washington, this is Houston Control. Washington, come in, Washington.